Well, here in Finland, everybody, or almost everybody, is on board with nuclear power. All the major parties in Parliament, including the left and the Greens, are right on board. It's one of the few things they agree on. I spoke to Taya Turman, who is the, in, the head of We Planet International, a senior member of the Greens Party here, and was instrumental in turning the Green Party round on nuclear. Taya Turman, thanks for joining us here on Reality Bites. How did you come to change your position on nuclear? Or first of all, what was your position and how did you come to change it? Uh, well, I've actually always been pro-nuclear, so uh, I w I've been an environmentalist all my life, since I was a child. Um, and I, I, I started reading about nuclear when I was a teenager, and I really didn't get why people were so against it. Uh, it wasn't causing uh, a hole in the ozone layer, it wasn't causing acid rains or rainforest destruction. Uh, those things I was worried about in the 80s. Um, and so I, I, I also knew that it wasn't causing any greenhouse gas emissions. And so I didn't really understand what the problem was, but I, I, I noticed that a lot of my friends in the environmental movement were very much against. Uh, so I felt alone and I was um, kind of afraid to say anything about nuclear at the time. Did you manage to persuade other people in the green movement in Finland that this was a correct position? Was that a difficult job? Uh, yeah, so there were a lot of people involved. Um, there was this uh, organization called the Science Greens that were founded uh, 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 in the beginning of 2000s. And gradually they started thinking um, that maybe we should uh, open the discussion about nuclear within the Green Party. I wasn't in the Greens at the time. I never, uh, I didn't join them because they were anti-nuclear and I never was. So I thought everyone was asking, why are you not in the Green Party? Because you're an environmentalist. I thought, well, they're against nuclear and I can't be any part of that. Um, but I, I started uh, acting as a chair uh, for a new environmental organization uh, that was started in 2015, which was pro-nuclear. So I was kind of operating outside of the Green Party in the beginning, convincing them from the outside. And then there were people from the Science Greens within the Green Party convincing the party from the inside. Um, and a few years went on and, and gradually all the anti-nuclear staff was being removed from the party platforms and positions. And then finally, I, I thought now it's the time for me to join the Green Party as well. And then two years ago, when I was um, at the par yearly party assembly here in Joensuu, actually, uh, we accepted several pro-nuclear statements into our party platform. So it was a long process. And uh, not only did we change the Green Party in Finland, but the whole envi environmental scene um, so that none of the environmental organizations in Finland are campaigning against nuclear at the moment. Now you also see renewables, wind, solar, a as part of the solution. Probably solar not so much here <laughs> in Finland, but... Yeah, I just check it's less than 1% uh, from the electricity pr uh, production last year in Finland. But you have a lot of wind. Yes. You have, I guess the further you get towards the Arctic Circle, the more wind you've got and the more isolated the land. Yeah, so we have 41% uh, of our e electricity coming from nuclear. So that's the biggest source of clean electricity in Finland. Uh, wind is around 18%. Uh, with hydro, uh, which is close to 90%, and then we have biomass, solar, uh, still uh, some fossil fuels, but 94% uh, of electricity in Finland is clean right now, and uh, it's huge, and it's, uh, well, most of it's thanks to, thanks to hydro, wind, and nuclear. How much of your thinking on nuclear uh, came from realizing that there are drawbacks to wind, particularly in terms of its impact on the natural environment? Uh, well, definitely. I, I realized that it requires more land and we can al also uh, see some nimbyism going on uh, when it comes to fin or, uh, wind already in Finland. So some of the areas are really, they have a lot of wind power already. So they're really concentrated in, in some particular areas and people are getting kind of tired to see windmills everywhere. And also there's areas where you can't put them. So we had one permit that was uh, denied because of it was a, a an important area for wolves, which is an endangered species in Finland. Uh, so it requires more land and nuclear uh, requires less land. I mean, we have the Olkiluoto Island that has three plants on one island and it produces 30% of Finnish electricity. Uh, nuclear also requires less mining. So a lot of people are worried about mining, but nuclear actually requires the least amount of mining when you compare it to any other 
uh, like solar or, or wind. So yes, that's definitely one of the, the reasons I support nuclear. And it's also energy security is a big thing, particularly here in Finland. And we are what, 40 or 50 kilometers from the Russian border and Russia's invasion of Ukraine must have concentrated mines here. Yes, absolutely. So uh, Finns have been very supportive of nuclear uh, for the past few years, but it, the support increased after the war started because uh, people realized that en energy security is more important than ever. Right now we're importing only 3% of electricity. Uh, we used to be one of the biggest importers of electricity uh, in Europe, but right now we're uh, importing only 3%. That was the statistics from last year, and that's largely thanks to Olke Lotto 3. Um, that was uh, started last year. And so, but yes, it's very important. We don't have as much hydro as Norway, for example. Uh, we don't have any fossil fuel resources. And of course, we don't even want to use them because of uh, well, the climate crisis. So nuclear is really uh, the best option to secure energy supply. Well, importantly, you're not reliant on Russia for gas, like some of your European neighbors. Yeah, exactly. It, it's it's always been very important for us, and I, I'm I'm happy that we made some more smart decisions in Finland. Now, one thing you've done successfully in Finland is to reclassify nuclear as, I guess, low carbon. Um, in the way it's talked about in most countries, in Australia, even in the EU, it's kind of a lesser option. You've got renewables, which is supposed to be the wonderful thing everybody wants, and that's wind, solar, hydro, and then nuclear over there somewhere. But it seems to make no sense that we shouldn't classify all of these together as low carbon, close to zero carbon fuels, right? Yeah, exactly. And I don't like the term renewables because that also includes biomass that has biodiversity problems attached to it. Uh, and biomass, when you, I mean, if you measure the emissions from the pipe, it's, it's close to fossil fuels or even more. So, I mean, uh, in theory, when you grow the forest, it will, you know, um, again, uh, bind that CO2 from the air. But really, biomass is renewable, but it's not as clean as nuclear. So I think it's more important to talk about low emission energy sources, clean energy sources than nuclear and renewables. I don't, I don't like those terms. Well, don't we don't need to come back to what the aim is of this whole thing. And, and that is, we want to reduce emissions uh, to net zero. That's the kind of level we're, we've arrived yeah. at by 2050. Surely anything that gets towards that is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean the atmosphere doesn't care about um, renewables or, or those classifications. I mean, it, the only thing that matters is how much CO2 we're emitting and nuclear is not emitting any when it's operating. So I don't, I don't see the need for a different kind of classifications. Just look at the CO2 emissions and um, do your legislation based on that. When the Greens came to see the, the light on this, if you like, what was the reaction? I mean, was it unified within the Green Party or were there people that held out and and, and thought they sold out in some way? Yeah, I mean, there, there were some people who have spent decades um, opposing nuclear, and for them it's really uh, difficult, if not even impossible, to change. But a lot of people did change their mind, even though they had uh, very long careers in politics. So that was brave of them, and that, that was very useful and helpful. Uh, so there were some people, and there are still some people in the Green Party who disagree, but by the time it, that in, when, it, when in 2022 we voted for those uh, pro-nuclear statements, uh, it was a very unified decision. So almost everybody agreed. So uh, it's, it's not dividing the party. But the reaction from other countries, from other Green Parties across the world, has been uh, uh, disappointed or even hostile. Uh, I, I, we received some feedback from Australia in 2022, for example. What was that? Uh, that were nuclear shields, <laughs> uh, which we thought it was pretty funny uh, to think that the nuclear industry in Finland would have bought uh, the Green Party. <laughs> the Green movement in Australia turned on you? Uh, I mean, some of the members uh, did post. I mean, it's not like, a, you know, High, high up party leaders uh, doing that. But, you know, some of the, the members and supporters of the Green Party certainly did attack us at the time. So you're the only Green Party in Europe so far to come on board with nuclear? Uh, yeah, I mean, officially, I think there's uh, in Norway, uh, the Green Party has also uh, adopted some like more pro-nuclear 
uh, stands, uh, which is a fortunate because they already closed their research reactor uh, before this happened. Um, so a little bit too late, but it's, I think it's happening in, in many European countries. There are Greens within the Green parties across Europe that are willing to change. They want to challenge the current uh, stances of the, the party. And I think change is happening and it's, it's happening not only in Europe, but um, in some other countries as well. How much of a difference did the Russian invasion of Ukraine make? It seemed to concentrate minds in Europe quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's really highlighted the importance of energy security, but there was also a downside for nuclear because uh, when uh, Russians attacked the, the nuclear plant there, that also, of course, caused some concerns. Uh, in Finland, the media reacted very well, explaining it's a situation that there's really no danger to Finnish people. But in other countries where media is not so educated, there were stories that were not true and highly exaggerated. But but um, yeah, I think it's really highlighted the importance of energy security. And that's why many countries are now looking into that and how to secure that. And many countries think that one of the solutions is nuclear. The, the polling's very interested in Finland when, from an Australian perspective. But here you've seen a gradual reduction in the number of people who oppose it. And I see in the latest the poll that I found, it's 6% of people oppose it here. That, yeah. And it had gone down dramatically after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in Finland, none of the parliament parties uh, oppose nuclear. The left support nuclear, social democrats uh, uh, support. Left support nuclear, social democrats support nuclear, the Greens support nuclear. So it's really like a unifying issue in Finland instead of um, dividing issue. But it, used, it didn't used to be that way. So in Finland, it was um, just, a decade ago, it was divided so that the lefts were against and the right, uh, uh, right wing parties were for, and it was really a divided issue, but not anymore. So we succeeded in convincing people in all different parties that nuclear is a good thing for their voters. So this is important because you have a centre right coalition now in yeah. in Finland. Uh, so the the Greens party. Uh, support them on nuclear. Does that mean everything is sweetness and light on the environment? Does everybody agree on the environment? No, well, the nuclear is, I think, <laughs> one of the few things that we agree on. So there's uh, still um, a lot of things that under debate. Uh, agriculture is one of them when it comes to emissions. We haven't been, I mean, we, we've been really successful at reducing emissions in the electricity sector. We still have a long way to go in, in the heating sector, but that's still like everyone agrees that we need uh, small nuclear reactors for that, for example. So no disagreement there. But when it comes to agriculture, transportation, other sources of emissions, the debate is much more heated. Well, that's where the hard work begins on, on zero emissions, doesn't yeah. it? Yes. Because electricity is only a relatively small part of the mix. Yes, There's exactly. a lot of hard work to do after that. Yeah. But I mean, having a clean, affordable energy is, uh, is really important for the other sectors to decarbonize as well. Like if you look at transportation, over 50% of cars sold last year were either plug-in hybrids or electric cars. And that's because we have very affordable electricity and, you know, the price is the best seller for people. Uh, I bought an electric car for environmental reasons, but I know I'm in the minority. So most people are looking at the price and driving with electricity is cheaper than driving with the gas. You know, that's going to make people buy electric cars. But it seems to me here in Finland that you've actually proven the way to do it. You, you're producing anything between 90 and 95% carbon free electricity. That is higher than Australia is aiming to do in 2030. Mm. And yet a lot of people in Australia do not see any way we can get to even our modest target of 84% using wind and solar alone. Surely that's it's case proved. It, yeah, I mean, a lot of people say that if you build nuclear, uh, you can't build uh, renewables at the same time. I think Finland has proved them wrong. Uh, we have built a lot of wind power at the same time when we were building new nuclear, and we have proven that it works. Uh, combining all of these uh, is the best way to go. And uh, since 2010, we have reduced our emissions in ele electricity by 87%. And within the last five years, 65%. So we've been doing huge strides and it's thanks to our uh, very rational policy that we 
we, we don't want to exclude, exclude any options. We want to use everything that we have uh, to achieve these targets. And you're no longer having to bring shiploads of coal across the Baltic from Poland anymore. Yeah, exactly. And, and we can, we've been able to shut down some of our coal plants earlier than we planned, thanks to uh, being able to build new nuclear and wind and solar. So use all of them. What about the cost? It's another argument that's often put up in Australia. Nuclear is too expensive. You've got relatively cheap electricity prices here. Yeah. So within the last 12 months, um, the average price has been around seven cents per kilowatt hour. And I mean, you have to add like trans transferring costs on top of that. That will be, it depends on the area, but for me, it's, it's around six cents. And that's only like the average electricity market price. So for example, I have an electric car, I can charge it during the night when the prices are even negative or usually around two, four cents uh, plus the transferring fee. So it's, it's, the prices are really low um, compared to many other countries. I think it's the second, second lowest price in Europe, uh, only Sweden uh, had lower prices than us last year, but they also have nuclear. So I think that proves that having nuclear in the system uh, leads to lower system costs. And that's what you see in your electricity bill. I mean, if something is cheap in theory, it doesn't mean that it's actually cheap when you're paying the bill. And I think Germans are learning that the hard way. <laughs> Times are tough for people on moderate incomes right now across the world. You've got inflation, we've got inflation. Is electricity something that's hurting people? If you, if you went out and asked people in the streets, what is it about cost of living that's bothering you? Would electricity be one of those things? Not in Finland, not this year. Not since uh, Alka Lula 3 was turned on. Uh, it was a problem before that because of the war and we stopped importing uh, energy from Russia. So the prices were high, but after we started Alka Lula 3, the prices haven't been a problem in Finland. Tell me about the Finnish economy. It's a mixed economy here. You've still got uh, a fair bit of industry and some heavy industry. Is the electricity coming down to the sort of level where you can keep that industry or are you losing companies offshore in the same way as happening in Germany? Uh, we're not losing industry, but uh, we do need more uh, electricity, clean electricity, if we want our industries to meet our climate targets. Because it's not only about electricity, it's about like process heat and, and stuff like that. And if they want to electrify some of the processes, like uh, all of the industries in Finland have done this roadmap for carbon uh, free industries. And at the time, this was a few years back, we counted that you need 10 more nuclear plants um, to meet that demand. So there's still room for new electricity if we want to, and especially if we want new investments in Finland, having clean, affordable energy is a, a a really good argument if you want to get some investments. Tell me about the waste issue. Again, this is another thing that's often put up as an objection that we nuclear waste is too dangerous. What's the experience here? Uh, the waste is not really uh, discussed anymore because we have the world's first repository and so we've kind of solved that thing and, and it's, not, it's not something that keeps coming up anymore and it was very widely accepted solution. So even the Green Party at the time, uh, when they were opposing nuclear energy, they did accept the, the repository because they thought that we need a responsible way to handle our own waste. I mean, we were producing waste, so there has to be a solution for that. So there was a very wide consensus that we need to do it. And it's people like it and it brought a lot of jobs into the, I mean, a lot of places were uh, competing to get that repository. So it was not it, like it was forced upon the people um, on that side. And I think that's very important to engage the local communities and explain the benefits. And that's why people living there are very happy with the repository. And it's not a debate anymore in Finland. It, it, it seems like a sort of upside down world here. Yeah. You know, uh, from an Australian perspective, suddenly nuclear is widely accepted. Nobody's got too much problem with the waste. Their energy bills have come down. What is it about Finland that, that has put you ahead of the pack on this one? It's um, not happening in Germany, for instance, in the same way. Yeah, I think uh, because of our geographical location, we always have to be very practical, practical about our decision making. Um, another good example was uh, the when we decided to join NATO. Uh, most people were against joining the NATO. Uh, just like two days before the war started. And after the war started, 
everyone decided that we should be in the NATO. So I think we're willing to change our minds if uh, circumstances require it. And, and Finnish people, are very, they rely on science and engineering and technology, and they're very pro-technology. So I think that's a very good base for, for nuclear energy. Because you had that, and we have highly educated people as well, and of course that helps. And, and a high focus on science education in this country. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think we've done a lot of things right. Like, like when I said that when we decided that we we're going to build the repository, there was uh, engagement at the local level um, and just the consensus that we need a solution. Uh, if you don't have that, then it's much more difficult. And uh, the Greens in Finland, they've always prioritized uh, climate and CO2 emissions and reducing, reducing them. So even when they were uh, opposing nuclear, they said that if closing down nuclear plants leads to increase in emissions, we must not do it. So there was always this priority and that, that's not a priority, for example, in Germany. The Greens movement in Australia uh, receives a lot of money from the renewable sector one way and another. That's the problem, isn't it, for green movements? You could become compromised by your source of funding if you're not careful. You managed to avoid that here. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's always a danger. It's not just the Green Green Party. It's just, just you know everyone can be <laughs> contaminated contaminated by the the funding that re they receive. Um, it's I don't think it's it's ever been a problem in Finland. It's I think the people were really genuine in in their worry and concern about the climate and the environment. Uh, but it was just the uh, the old myths and misconceptions about nuclear that made them um, be against nuclear. And once uh, they found out that they're incorrect, they changed their minds. And here we are, uh, probably the only country in the world where even Greenpeace is not campaigning against nuclear. What advice can you offer us in Australia? How can we start changing the debate to make it less polarized and start having a more productive discussion about genuinely the best way to get to net zero rather than something based on some preconceived dogma? Yeah, so I think uh, you must find arguments that are convincing for different parties. Like for Social Democrats in Finland, it was the jobs. We have steel industry, they're going to need clean electricity. You need reliable electricity production for that. Uh, for the lefts as well, for the Greens, it was the environmental reasons. And I think there needs to be a trust. So sometimes uh, the environmental people, they don't trust people who are for nuclear because they think they're for nuclear for wrong reasons and they're really not uh, supporting nuclear for climate reasons and they don't really want to do anything about the climate they just support nuclear uh, to annoy the lefts or something like that which is actually sometimes true I mean we did have people in Finland who were pro-nuclear just to annoy people on the left uh, that happens and that that needs to be addressed so I think for the people who are pro-nuclear but also pro Pro climate, they must are, they must say that I'm I'm really for climate targets. I really support reaching climate targets, and this is why I support nuclear. Um, and just be very respectful and try to understand where the other side is coming from. So I think that needs to happen. That happened in Finland, and I hope it will happen in Australia. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your your time, Tayo. Thank you.